Well, good morning, brethren and sisters. When we woke up this morning, we, uh, when we did eventually wake up this morning, we uh, noticed that the beautiful sun that we had seen was uh, gone and there was rain for the morning. And of course, nature teaches us that the sun doesn't shine on every day, that the uh, perfect weather is sometimes disrupted by the clouds and the rain, which of course we do need. And uh, in a sense, that's a good introduction for what we want to consider this morning, because so far in our considerations of the Ark of the Covenant, we really have had a, almost a perfect parable of God's plan of salvation. We have seen, obviously, first of all, the principles of that salvation. We've then seen the way in which salvation takes place through the way of salvation, through resurrection. We then saw the way in which God's master plan will be realized through the conquering of the kingdoms of men, through the falling of the walls of Jericho, and the final reaching out of God's mercy to the ends of the earth. So, by the time we'd got to the end of, of yesterday, we, we've almost, we've got to the conclusion of the matter. We're in Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet, and, and the story is complete. And if there were only four sessions in this Bible school, we could well have ended it there, but we needed to have two more. And the story of the ark, of course, did continue. And in the event that we're going to consider today is something really for us, isn't it? Because the reality is that when man is introduced into God's equation, man is far from perfect. And our weaknesses complicate God's plans. Not that he didn't know this, but they do. And so God's plan for salvation is rested, in a sense, by our sin and our pride. And the perfect journey that we have seen so far of the ark suddenly hits a rocky road in our consideration this morning. And we're going to see the weakness of Israel lead to really devastating consequences for Israel and for the Philistines and for a leader and even for the ark itself. But of course, as in all these episodes, there's lessons to be learned and hopefully we can enjoy them together this morning. We're going to be considering together 1st of Samuel chapters 4 through 7. And of course, with four chapters to consider, we're not going to be going into all the details of this story, hoping once again that you will remember it from your Sunday school days. Very briefly to remind you, we will look at some of the details, but we will be really moving in at a number of verses. This is the story of the ark when it was taken into battle against the Philistines. You'll remember that the Philistines uh, uh, won the battle they took the ark away into captivity. They captured the ark. The ark then spent some very unpleasant months with the Philistines. It wasn't very kind to them. Eventually, the Philistines needed to get rid of the ark in a way, uh, release themselves of this burden. They returned the ark back to the children of Israel, where eventually it ended up in the house of Abinadab. So that's the story, very simply. Uh, so we don't need to go through that detail now. We can just home in on what is the message behind the story. What kind of patterns we're being taught that can help us to understand better the way in which we should approach God and to understand better the plan of salvation that God had and has with all of us. And hopefully we'll see God teaching the children of Israel more of these aspects uh, concerning his salvation. So let's go through and, and, and set some of the context. Um, if you'll come with me, to, or you should be there in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And we're going to look at that context in verse 1. Before we do that, just to consider the nation of Israel that was at that time. Uh, they had come through the victories of Joshua. They had settled in the land. They'd entered into the period of the judges. And really, this, this, these generations that had come uh, through the, the wilderness journeys into the land and become the early settlers of the land, they were really the children of monotheism, if you will. And what I mean by that. Um, obviously those who'd been in the land of Egypt had been exposed to all the Egyptian religions, but the children that had been born, almost this clean generation, remember through the wilderness wanderings, they waited until all those over the age of 20 had died, so that those who entered the promised land, I don't know if you ever thought of this, were only those who had ever only been exposed to the true faith. Isn't that amazing? That's one of the, the, the implications of what happened through the wilderness wanderings. So that when they came into the promised land, that generation that entered were the children of monotheism. And what I mean by that, all they ever knew 
was Exodus 20, verse 3 and 4. And what were the first two commandments? Think about what they were. The first was, I am the only God you will worship, there is none other, the concept of one God. The second commandment was, you shall make no graven images. The concept that God is invisible and is not found in something that can be seen. So they were brought up on this concept, which was foreign to all other religions, that there is only one God and He is invisible. And so this generation entered as God would have had them into the, into the promised land. And of course they entered under the warning of Joshua that when you get there, you're going to find something you've never discovered before. You're going to find that other people have a different perspective of God, have a different view of God. And I think we're going to see more and more of this come out in this particular lesson this morning. Other people have a religion that they can touch and see and feel. Be careful, was the injunction given to them by Moses and also by Joshua. And so we pick up the record in 1 Samuel 4 and at verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined in battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So, very interesting. This starts with a very difficult situation for Israel. They are beaten by the enemy. 4,000 of them are dead. Verse 3. Wherefore, they said, hath Yahweh smitten us today before the Philistines? So that's the, the great question any of us ask when we have an experience in our lives that perhaps we didn't expect, that is one that causes grief, causes suffering. I guess many people in London today are asking that question. Why did God let this happen? So they were no different. Wherefore, hath Yahweh allowed us to be smitten or smitten us this day? And in our own lives, when we ask that question, we often make a mistake of trying to find the answer too quickly. The Word of God actually provides the answer for every single suffering that you go, you go through. And I think I've mentioned this before. If you want to find the answer, it's in First Peter chapter 1. But, of course, we want to find other answers. We want to try and work out exactly what it is. Is there something that we maybe have done? Or, or is it? And so we often jump to conclusions very quickly. And sometimes when we jump to conclusions about why certain experiences have happened in our lives too quickly, the consequences, as we will see in this situation, can be very dangerous. They wanted a specific answer. And before God could provide them with an answer, they came up with their own answer for how they could correct the problem. For what the problem perhaps was and how they could correct it. And we see in their answer, I think it will become clear, the underlying problem that had crept into their religion. Their solution is there in verse 3, uh, sorry, in verse 3, yes, continuing the verse, let us fetch the ark of the covenant of Yahweh out of Shiloh unto us, that when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hand of the enemies. Ah, they said. We lost the battle. Because we did not have the ark. Not just, they didn't say we lost the battle because Yahweh was not with us. We lost the battle because we did not have the ark. Perhaps the Philistines, when they had come out to battle, had uh, Dagon or one of their gods' uh, representatives. It's very much like, I don't know whether uh, they do this in American football, which of course none of you probably watch, but we, we do watch rugby, I will confess, at home on the odd occasion. Now when the schools play games of rugby, often when the, the top teams come on to play, they have a mascot. Do you have a mascot? Yeah. And they put the mascot down. I don't know what it's meant to represent, but and it's often just a teddy bear. It doesn't really help for a rugby game. But it, it's the mascot. This is, this is what they, that is, is going to help them perhaps to, to win the game. And so it was that they saw, perhaps, that the thing that they were missing, that had made them lose the battle, was in fact the ark. So in verse 4, they send men to Shiloh, and, and, and read carefully here. And they brought back the ark of the covenant of Yahweh Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Now that little phrase, uh, uh, which, where it says, 
where Yahweh is enthroned between the cherubim. It appears on about four or five occasions with reference to the ark. And it gives us this idea that we haven't really dwelt on so much, and we'll talk a lot more about tomorrow, of the ark of the covenant representing also the throne of God. Representing the fact that God is ultimately going to be king, and is king now, and this is his throne. And I think it's interesting that it's used here. Why? Because it's almost as if to say, when the ark was in Shiloh, there Yahweh was enthroned between the cherubim. The point is that this ark only has value when the king is enthroned on it. Of itself, it's a piece of furniture. It's a throne. And all they had gone to get from Shiloh was the throne, which they bring back to the place of battle. They had come to see the ark as having power. They were becoming focused, I put it to you, brethren and sisters, on visual religion. And here lay their essential problem. Look at verse 3 of chapter 4. When the people came into the camp, now they were bringing it into the camp of the, where they were in battle. The elders of Israel said, Wherefore, sorry, wherefore hath Yahweh spent us this day before the Lord? Let us fetch, sorry, this is the verse we have read. Let us fetch the ark, we're going to read it more carefully, of the covenant of Yahweh out of Shiloh unto us, that when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hands of ours. Notice the pronouns. This is very interesting. That when it comes, it might save us. The ark, it will come, it will save us from our enemies. The Philistines, they have their graven images. They have their idols. Now we will bring our talisman, our mascot, like all the other nations. And we know that this was their thinking, don't we? Because later on in the life of Samuel, they would express the same weakness to Samuel when they said, Behold, you are old and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations, a king that we can feel and touch and see. Because we need a visual religion. And the first two commandments God gave them was to teach them that he was invisible. That he was in the realm of the spirit that cannot be seen. But they wanted the realm that could be seen and touched and felt. And there is a great pattern for us, isn't it? It's this. There's a great lesson. It's for us when the pattern becomes more important than the reality. And in a sense, sometimes even for us, sometimes the pattern can come so important that it's delinked from the principle and the spiritual reality that it was meant to be teaching. And every one of us, as much as we can look at these Israelites and shake our heads and look at the Pharisees when we read in the Gospels of how they were so into their visual religion, we can shake our heads. We need to think very carefully. Because in the times of Israel, this is what had happened when Jesus came. They were completely engrossed in the trappings of their religion. The, their visible religion had reached its heights. So that Jesus said these words in Matthew 23. I, I just find these marvelous words to consider. Woe unto you, 23, 23 of Matthew, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. These are things you can barely see. Tiny things, and you take a tenth of them which you can barely see, but you can see it. For anything that can be seen, you will go to the utmost detail is what Jesus is saying, because it's visible. That's the nature of your religion. But you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Tell me, can you see these things? Judgment? Mercy? Faith? These invisible things, yes, they can be demonstrated through words, but essentially they are invisible. These were the weightier matters. They weren't interested in them. It wasn't what their religion had become. It was all about the visible things, the things you could see and touch and feel. These ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone. You have cleaned the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. And what of us? Well, I think by God's grace, our religion, our covenant, the new covenant has very few visual aspects. Baptism, breaking of bread, head coverings. 
Do we see always the spiritual reality behind the pattern? But we also do have other visual aspects, not necessarily based on the fundamentals of the covenant, but that are, are a part of our worship. Meetings, Bible schools, the clothes we wear, committees, the way we preach. Things that can be seen, I, I, I'm emphasizing here. All the things that we can see. And sometimes we also, every one of us has fallen into the trap, if we're honest with ourselves, can sometimes be so obsessed with what should be the pattern and begin to lose sight of the spiritual reality. And I don't know how far removed, you, you may think we've come some way from a group of people who were wanting to see an ark rather than the spiritual reality that lay behind it. The, the essential problem is the same, is that as humans living in a natural world, we will always move towards feeling more comfort in the things that we can see and feel and touch. We're in that world, but God is calling us to another world. To a world where the things we can feel and touch are not as important as mercy, judgment, and faith. And the Jewish religion at one stage had become so fixated on these patterns that, that and, and you will know these words, but let's have a look at them in Amos 5. Their visual religion had become so much to them and become so delinked from the spiritual reality. Their focus on the ark for the ark's sake. Their focus on the sacrifice for the sacrifice's sake. Their focus on the meeting and being at the meeting for the sake of that alone. And they had lost the spiritual reality. Amos 5 verse 21. I hate. These are, these are strong words. I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take you away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vows. And look at the message. It's the same as Jesus spoke. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Can you see judgment? Can you see righteousness? And look at verse 25. This is the one that really, have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? What is God saying? For 40 years, that's what they did. In fact, there was one offering, as you would well know, the offering of burnt offering, that was the continual offering. How can you be asking us, God, if we have offered sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness? We had one that was continually offered before you. The moment you lose the reality behind the pattern, the pattern means nothing to me. It was only meant to help you to understand the reality. The ark means nothing to me if you do not understand the spiritual reality. Verse 5 of 1 Samuel 4, when the ark of the covenant of Yahweh came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang. They applauded. It must have given them memories of Jericho. Now they're in for it. Remember when we had the ark with Jericho, the wars came tumbling down. These Philistines will never withstand us now. We'll shout like we shouted on the seventh day. The ark is with us. There will be victory. And little did they know that all they had was a box covered in gold. Nothing more. If anything, if anything, the arrival of the ark made the Philistines check where they were in the process. Because look at verse 7. The Philistines were afraid. For they said, and look at how, look at how they speak. Isn't this very insightful? They say, God is coming to the camp. You see, that's the way they saw it. Just like the Israelites were now seeing it, they, they saw the Ark of the Covenant as the God, just like Dagon was God. They, they knew nothing of patterns and symbols. So when they heard that the Ark was coming, they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. And of course, as a result of them thinking that the, that the God of Israel had come into the camp, they really thought they would need to, to equip themselves and really go out for battle. So on the one hand, you had the Israelites relying on this mascot because that's what they thought it would now do, working magic for them, rather than trusting, having faith on the invisible but living God of Israel. On the other hand, you have the Philistines who, thinking the same, now decide we better make sure that we do our best in this battle because there's no magic on our side. 
And of course, the result is recorded for us in verse 10. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. A sad day in Israel. Previously, 4,000 men had died. Now they thought they had found the solution, 30,000 dead. And to add insult to injury, the Ark of the Covenant is captured. And there's terror in the land. You can imagine it. For all those who had come to believe that this, this holy item was the ultimate source of protection for them. Not only has it not protected them, it's lost. And every man fled to his tent. There's fear in Israel. And isn't there a a strong spiritual echo there? It was because they wanted... Sorry. the, The message had been clear. They all ran. They had brought the throne without the king and there was no value for them. But think about it. What had led to this situation? It was because of the foolishness of the Israelites... It was because of their lack of perception that the tabernacle and God's most holiest piece of that tabernacle had been lost. And here's where that strong spiritual echo is that I was referring to a few moments earlier. It was because they wanted a visual savior. It was because they were fixated on a king who could do things for them now, who could release them from Roman bondage, who could make them the the, the, the head and not the, the feet. They were expecting a priest who would conform to their tradition and their religious trappings. And when the lonely man from Nazareth came and spoke about the hidden things of the heart and of the kingdom of God of an age to come, they ended up rejecting him. They ended up rejecting God's plan for salvation. They ended up sending him into captivity. Isaiah says this, Who has believed our report? What was Jesus' report? He wasn't the one they were expecting to hear. He was about the inside, not the outside. And to whom is the arm revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form. Have you ever thought about these words carefully? These words are not just there to tell us that Jesus, people would say, you know, Jesus obviously wasn't a good looking man. Look at what Isaiah 51 says. That's not the point. He has no form nor comeliness that we should see him, that, we should, that when we see him, And no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. In other words, there was nothing visual about Jesus. His report was one of invisibility. His report was one of faith and judgment and mercy. And when we looked at him, visually there was nothing that made us attracted to him. And so we despised him. We esteemed him not. We rejected him, as happened on that day with the ark. And look at verse 11 of Samuel 4. The ark was lost to the enemy, wasn't it? Jesus was rejected and lost to the grave, albeit only temporary. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were slain. The ark is captured, and two sinners die with it. Jesus, the Ark of the Covenant, would die in the presence of two thieves because of Israel's foolishness. You see, sin and human weakness is a serious matter. We can never and should never make light of the cost of our sin and human flesh. In this case, it cost the possession of the most holy symbol they had. In our case, it cost the life of a perfect sinless man. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was in him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Isn't that what happened? When he was crucified, every one went to his own way. The disciples fled. And what do we read here? Every man fled to his tent. Oh, there's strong echoes here of what's going on. Every man fled to his tent. And Eli, Eli the great priest at that time, hears the news. And although there's tragedy surrounding the death of his sons, this is very interesting. Look at verse 18. And when they mentioned the ark of God, 
Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of his gate and died. I mean, imagine here's a day that you hear that your two sons have died, but, but Eli responds to the fact that the ark is taken. Oh, he, he knew the real issue that had happened, yeah. Perhaps even at this point he realizes what has happened and how devastating it is. And he dies as a result of hearing that the ark has been captured. Interesting the way it describes this. It says his neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. And of course, with our spiritual glasses on, we say, why does it tell us he was an old man and heavy? Well, naturally, of course, that explains how he could fall over backwards and die. We used to smile at that when uh, I was a Sunday school scholar. But why else? He was an old man and heavy. He led Israel for 40 years. Is it not that he represented the dispensation of the law? That thing which had been heavy upon them. That, that old covenant that is represented in the 40 years. And, and, and at the time that Jesus goes into captivity, the veil of the covenant is torn, symbolizing, as Romans says, for Christ is the end of the law. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took out the way, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. At this point, when the ark goes into captivity, we know that's the point at which the law, in its sense, in the way that it, 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 it was heavy upon us, in that it could not ultimately provide salvation, comes to an end in the form of Eli, as Eli falls over backwards and a new dispensation is gained. And isn't there an irony in this event? Because at this time of loss, there's also a gain. You, you might not remember this because we haven't read all the chapter, but on this day of loss, the loss of the ark, the death of Eli, and of course his two children, we read this about his daughter-in-law. Verse 19 of Samuel 4. And Eli's daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and husband were dead, she bowed herself in travail, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, you have borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. It's interesting, isn't it? At the time of death, there's birth. And isn't that a principle of the word of God? When there's loss, there's gain. As Paul said, that which is my, was my, my loss is now my gain. When there was death, there was life. And so at this point of the loss of the ark, of the death of Eli, there is the birth of a son. And his name is Ichabod. Oh, there, there are messages here for us. The glory is departed, she said, from Israel. Is it possible that here is a pattern or a parable of one of the most important aspects of God's salvation plan, that the salvation was going to move from Israel to the Gentiles, that indeed that which was Israel's loss would be our gain, that at, through the treatment and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, the way would be open. The middle wall of partition would be taken down and the Gentiles now would be exposed to the salvation of God, to the Ark of the Covenant. Romans 11 says, I ask then, did they stumble that they might fall? May it never be. But by their fall, salvation. Oh, that's just so accurate. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Because of their fall, because they were foolish enough to take this Ark into battle, it's now going to the Gentiles. It's a remarkable type there, isn't there? The Gentiles are exposed firsthand, probably for the first time, to God's salvation. They would have experience now with the Ark of the Covenant. And you might say, well, it was a far from very pleasant experience with God's salvation. And that it was. But I believe we will see again tomorrow that that experience they had, which was for a few months, 
with the Ark of the Covenant would deeply have affected the people from that area. And we will see a number of evidence of that tomorrow, but certainly you will be aware that there were Gittites who came and supported David, who came from the very area where this Ark was now going, who would have been exposed to the symbol of God's salvation directly. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, did they not? And said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Israel. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Indeed, the glory had departed from Israel, but in doing so, it came to give hope to the Gentiles, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. Here is Jesus who came to bring the message also to the Gentiles, which is what Matthew 4 is telling us. And it says in verse 12, When the message came to tell them that the ark had been lost, is this just an extra piece of detail? And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, verse 12, Samuel 4, and came to Shiloh Shiloh, the same day with his clothes rent and with the earth upon his head, and he came with the message to say that the ark has been taken. Paul speaking. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Is it possible that even that pattern is there? That it would be the man of Benjamin who would come with the news that the ark has departed from Israel and gone to the Gentiles? As it would be a man of Benjamin, Saul of Tarsus, who would be given the responsibility to bring the glory to the Gentiles and tell them of this message? The patterns indeed are hidden away in the detail of Scripture. The Philistines return victorious. Mistakenly, they believe they've captured God the God of Israel, as if God were found in a physical object like their gods. But they had captured, in a sense, God's symbol of salvation. But in their hands, we will see that God's salvation can also be destruction. And we've mentioned this point before. That which had been powerless in the hands of the Israelites because it had just become a golden chest with no value because they had not seen the spiritual reality. Now in the hands of the Philistines, God would make it become powerful again so that they would be exposed to him. And verse, chapter 5, verse 2. The Philistines took the ark of God. They brought it into the house of Dagon, the right place for an ark that is an idol, and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod rose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of Yahweh. Isn't that beautiful? And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they rose early on the mor- morrow morning, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off. In the presence of Yahweh, the gods of the world fall face down in the presence of God's salvation. And aren't there great echoes there of Genesis 3.15? And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. The head of Dagon, this symbol of sin, In the presence of God's salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. The two next to each other. And they come in in the morning and Dagon's head is cut off. And the Ark of the Covenant remains. And I guess, in a way, it was a temporary bruise to the hill, as the Ark is in the hands of the Philistines. But in the verses that follow, and we have no time to go through their detail, we're told of the severe devastation that came upon the Philistines. And it's, it's quite amusing if you have time to read the detail because there were these five different Philistines or four different cities and they were all meant to be friends, but the way they treat each other would surely not be the way that we would treat friends as we are here. I'm sure if you found something that ended up giving you boils and leprosy, you wouldn't pass it to me as a friend. And that's what they did. They would have a terrible experience with the ark and then they would say to another king down the road, would you like to have it for a while? (laughs) And so they passed it on from hand to hand until everybody was suffering together. I suppose that's another way of looking at fellowship, suffering together. And, 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 And from verse 6 to verse 12, for example, look at this. I'm just going to highlight, I'm not going to read the whole verses, but from verse 6 to verse 12 we see how the ark 
is reacting in their presence. And, and just get the feeling of these words. It was heavy upon them. It destroyed them and smote them with emeralds. His hand is sore upon us, verse 7. Verse 9, with a very great destruction, he smote men. Verse 10, to slay us. Verse 11, that it slay us not. Verse 11, deadly destruction was very heavy there, were smitten. On 10 occasions in those seven verses, you get this idea of the ark being a a heavy, destructive force upon them. The symbol of God's salvation had become a symbol of death and destruction. You see, God's salvation, as we all very well know, is a two-edged sword. Paul says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's the same ark, but for those who, 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 who cannot understand it, it's foolishness. It's a stumbling block. But, but for those who understand, it's the power to be saved. Isn't that phenomenal? Perhaps if you could keep your place in Joshua, you could come across to Hebrews 10, where perhaps the lesson becomes even more personal for us. I guess everyone sitting right here in this room right now, at this point in their lives, views this salvation as something dear. Something to commit to. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. But in the journey of life, if we should think of turning our back on it, if we should think of pursuing another way, it cannot be neutral, as it was not neutral in the hands of the Philistines. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Here's the exhortation. Don't lose the faith you have right now as you sit in this room here at Shippensburg without wavering. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So our, our responsibility is to encourage each other not to lose that faith, not forsaking the assembling of, of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Why? Verse 26. For if you sin willfully... After that you have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So, brethren and sisters, we have here a very sober lesson. These are holy things, this, this covenant we have, invisible as it is. If we treat it in a way that is unacceptable, of how much sore punishment, as we see this punishment that was being leashed out on the Philistines, because they treated the things of the first covenant as unholy. How much sore a punishment is the warning of Hebrews 10. And of course, eventually after having suffered this punishment in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 11, they come out with a solution. They say in verse 11, send the covenant box of Israel back to its own place so it won't kill our families, kill us and our families. Well, that's, that makes sense. The ark had to go back to the place it belonged. And this is the point. God, His salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, always has and always will have a place where it can save and be effective. Only in that place. It was in this place, only in this place, that it provided atonement for the people on that special festival day. When the ark was in the right place, it was extremely beneficial. But the Philistines had learned, and this is why I say they learned a lot through these experiences, they had learned that when it was in the wrong place, it caused pain. And our faith is similar, isn't it? In the right place, it can save us and make a huge impact on our life. In the wrong place, it leads to disaster. You might say, well, where is that place? Well, for the tabernacle, it was right in the middle, wasn't it? We were at the tabernacle. Uh, uh, very kind, uh, uh, Matthew Trow brought us to go and see the tabernacle. Uh, not the tabernacle, I should tell you. The, another pattern of the tabernacle. And uh, we're able to see the centrality of the ark. In especially the room, the Holy of Holies, in the center, right in the center. So God has a place in the center of us where he can work. Of course, we're told where that is. 
Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Right in the center. That's where I want to dwell. That's where I can be effective. That's where my salvation plan has to get to. The place that is invisible. Oh yes, I can't see whether he's living in your heart. You can't see if he's living in my heart. But that's the only place it can be effective. And so they decide that in order to appease the ark, they must send five mice and five uh, symbols of the tumors that they had uh, to appease the ark. And there are some seeds of wisdom. First of Samuel 6, verse 5. We read, and ye shall give. Look at this. They, 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 they have learned something. We must see this. The Gentiles have learned something through their exposure. Ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Isn't that strange? They were very enamored by the ark, no doubt. But they are also now talking about the God of Israel and about giving him glory. Peradventure he would lighten his hand from off you and from off your God. These are their wise men speaking. These are not Israelites. Look at verse 6. Wherefore then do you harden your hearts? And this sounds like one of the prophets of Israel. As the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go? And they departed. I mean, these Gentiles now seem to know about the history of Israel. They're giving glory to God. They're humbling themselves. They've moved their focus from the ark to the God of Israel. And they knew that they needed to appease God. But there are some of the fundamentals, aren't there, of the new covenant coming through that they had learned. And so they take the ark and they put it on two cows in a new cart. Very interesting. I think practically what they did, they said that they kept the calves of the cows and they brought these two uh, cows that are, or oxen that had never actually uh, uh, pulled a cart before. They put the ark on top and, uh, of, of a cart and they had the two cows. And so one would think that naturally these oxen that had never really uh, 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 pulled a cart before would want to go back to the stables where their uh, calves were. And so I guess what the Philistines were doing is they were saying, if these oxen pull the cart down the road, we will know it will be like a sign from God that God is leading the oxen and bringing the ark back to the place it belongs, that it, it, it doesn't need to stay with us any longer, for which they would have been mightily reveal, uh, relieved. And of course that is what happened. The oxen took the, the ark uh, uh, back. Um, have you ever uh, a good little cross-reference there to that passage? Isaiah 1 verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Ooh, it's pretty much the same context as where we are now. Look at verse 3. The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Isn't that an irony? Israel didn't know God, and here is an ox which knows its master, and it's bringing the ark back to where it belongs. Beautiful words. So the ark is brought back in verse 13 of 1 Samuel 16. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping with their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, and they rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, Beth Shemite, and stood there. And there was a great stone, and they cleaved the wood of the cart and offered the kind of a burnt offering unto Yahweh. And there was great joy in Beth Shemesh. And there was the place they called of the great stone. It almost speaks now of the return of the Lord Jesus back to the Jews. And we're not going to go into the detail because even some of them in that town mistreat the ark and they, and they suffer the consequences. But if you come now to the end of the, of the story in First of Samuel verse 3, we see the problem brought back into focus. Remember, we said from the outset, Israel had, had lost God with them because they had become so focused on the visual aspect of religion. And of course, Samuel sums this up for us in First of Samuel, verse 3. And Samuel spoke unto all the house of Israel, saying, remember, he's just become leader now because Eli has died. If you do not return unto Yahweh with all your hearts, then put away. You see, here's the issue. See what had been happening in the background? The strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you. And prepare your hearts unto Yahweh and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. That's the solution to the question you asked way back in 1st of Samuel. And the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtoreth, and they served Yahweh only. Verse 8, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto Yahweh, our God, for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. What a progression. Remember, earlier they had said, The ark will save us, it will come, and it will save us. Now in verse 8, they say to Samuel, Cry unto Yahweh, our God. The God we can't see. 
the God of the first two commandments that we cannot see, that is only the one God. Cry to him and he will save us. And Samuel did just that. Samuel cried unto them. And we, 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 we can see this in, just get back to first of Samuel, chapter 6. Chapter 7, rather, verse 9. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering and holy unto Yahweh. And Samuel cried unto Yahweh for Israel. And Yahweh heard him. And as Samuel was offering up a burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But Yahweh thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel. And look at what happens. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath Yahweh helped us. So you can see this full progression. We had a, a full story here, haven't we? It started with them where? In Ebenezer. That was where they, they were first defeated. And it started with them believing that, that the ark could save them as a visual image being taken in by the religions of the world. And now they've come full circle and they can see their God again. And they know who he is and they know he's the invisible God. And so he gives them victory and they end up right back at the place they started and now they have victory and their celebration, Ebenezer. This is the place where God helps, the stone of help. The stone which you rejected now is your help. The stone which the builders rejected. And so it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come up against Israel. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. The one whom they rejected. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. And so all Israel shall be saved. 